Hello and welcome to Bayside Church. Good to see you. And um, my co-host is Gabrielle Elliott. That's right. That's right. A new a new name for a, yeah. a new season. You got married, what, four weeks ago? Yeah, about yeah. four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago now. Yeah. So, um, welcome back. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Honeymoon wonderful. Oh, amazing. We went to the Pacific Islands on a cruise and oh, it was... Oh. I just want to go live on Mystery Island, but oh, nobody beautiful. lives on Mystery Island, <laughs> well, so I can't. <laughs> that's a mystery. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. But yes, it's been a great season yeah. and um, very glad to be back. But in speaking of being glad to be back, we also want to welcome anybody who hasn't actually joined us on Church Online before. We want to welcome you and we're yeah. so glad that you have been able to join us today. Um, and we'd actually like to get to know you a little bit better as well. So the host is posting a link in the chat right now. And if you can just follow that link and fill it out, one of our awesome pastoral team members will contact you uh, during the week and just see how we can get you connected in yeah. our church life. But yeah, um, I think it's time for some worship. I think now. so too. Worship sounds good to me. So I'll yeah. pray and then we'll head over. Fabulous. So, Let's pray. Yeah. Father God, thank you for today, Father. Thank you that you've given us this opportunity to come and to sing your praises, Lord. And God, as we enter into this time of worship and into this service, Father, we just pray that you prepare our hearts and soften them to hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. search the world but it couldn't feel me a man's empty praise and treasures the fate are never enough but you came along and put me back together is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you there's nothing nothing is better than you yes I know Lord, you've seen them all, and just to you call me friends. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. You 
will be forever mine. You are forever mine. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great! How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing the first verse again. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself. at his voice and trembles at his voice how great how great
Great Thou Art, what a beautiful song. That song actually for me is such like a favourite. Like right. I can remember being yeah. a little kid and my granddad used to go around singing it and then to, because of that for me it just brings so much joy, you know. Stunning. So like. And also yeah. that story makes me feel incredibly old. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because <laughs> you know, your granddad used to sing that when you were a little girl and I'm like my goodness, you know, I was already well into my adult years. By that time, oh, well, that's all right. Oh, I thought that song was like years old, like no. hundreds of years. How great is our God? No, how great thou art. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, how great thou art. Is that what is I so funny. Saying. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't feel old anymore. Oh, no. Good, good. I'm glad I could. We could clear that up. But any, anyway, we're going to come into a time of offering now. So if yep. you would like to um, give today, there are multiple ways you can do so, and all of those are listed on the screen for you right now. And Pastor Rob is going to bring us a message around that. Yeah, I'm just going to bring you a couple of verses actually from uh, the Gospel of Luke. I love this. And I've been reading the Passion Translation over the last little while. Uh, every now and again, I, I read a different translation because it freshens it up, mm. you know, and it gives you a slightly different perspective on some of the, um, the Greek and Hebrew words. So uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 says, Give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement of your return. And I just thought it'd be great to reflect on that. Um, I wanna thank you for your giving to Bayside Church. It enables us to do so much uh, as a church, including our online uh, services and community and, you know, so much more that we do as a church comes from your generosity. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you for, for giving. And also for those of you who have participated in First Fruits this year as well, mm. uh, we are now over $70,000. Wow. Which is really cool. That's it's amazing. more coming in every week. Oh, man. So, uh, thank you, Bayside Church know, community. Right? That's amazing. awesome. So our target this year is 120 k and I reckon we can hit that and maybe even <laughs> go over, which would be awesome Speaking as well. Speaking that out in faith. So, indeed, yes. indeed. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask for your blessing upon every gift and every giver in this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. You ready for a sermon? I am so ready for a sermon. Me too. Here's Sandra. Hi, and great to be with you to share God's Word with you today. It's a King's Long Weekend. I hope you've had a wonderful weekend so far. Uh, can you get over the fact that it's called the King's Birthday Weekend? It's a bit of an adjustment, isn't it? I mean, it's been almost a lifetime. Well, it has been a lifetime of calling it the Queen's Birthday Weekend. Uh, and so it takes a bit of adjusting to the change. I guess what hasn't changed is the fact that it's still in June. Funny how King or Queen don't change their birthday. It's quite, quite a funny thing. But can you believe it? We're in June. June. I, that means we're six months away from Christmas. But before we race ahead to that, I wonder how you're going with all your goals and, and you know, faith aspirations for this year. You know, I think it was only a couple of months ago that we were at the beginning of the year when we're thinking about the year ahead and what we're hoping for and dreaming for and praying for and wanting to see God move in our, in our lives. I wonder how you're going. I wonder if you're on your way and you're staying in faith and uh, you're stepping out. Or has life kind of taken over? Have you maybe placed those things in the too hard basket? 
Uh, well, today we're going to look at a topic called living in your discomfort zone, which I think will help you with some of those things that you may be hoping and dreaming for. Now, many years ago, I used to be an English literature student. And like all good English lit students, you study the greats. You study people like Thomas Keats, Jane Austen, Thomas Hardy. Uh, you look at the great William Shakespeare, of course. I mean, William Shakespeare has contributed so much to the literary world in terms of plays and, and um, uh, you know, things that you can read, obviously. Uh, even the current uh, I, Juliet musical has been inspired by Romeo and Juliet. And, you know, I think about Shakespeare, there's so many great one-liners that we even use today uh, in quotes. Of course, you know, talking about Romeo and Juliet, there's that famous one line, oh, Romeo, Romeo, where art thou, Romeo? And then you have maybe some others like from King Lear, nothing comes from nothing. No, nothing does come from nothing. But there's one that I think particularly stands out. To be or not to be, that is the question. Now that comes from the play Hamlet. And I, I look at that as a former literature student and as a current student of the word today, and I go, if really, is that the only question? Surely Hamlet, there are other questions. I'm sure there are. And to know if there are other questions, you have to have context, of course. So in the context of Hamlet saying that famous one line, that he's just discovered that his father's been murdered by his uncle. Now his father is the king which means he is the prince. And as he's contemplating this gruesome act that's taken place and what it means, he realises that if his uncle's gone for his father, he's probably going to go after him. And so he's actually thinking, is it better for me to live or to die? Is it better for me to just call it quits right now rather than face this horrendous possibility that my, my uncle's going to go after me or do I, you know, do I die right now? In other words, sometimes in life, often in life, there are challenges, there are discomforts, there's potential pain up ahead. Are we better to push on through that or are we better to call it quits today? So really another question we could ask is to settle or not to settle? That is a question Hamlet could have asked. Now I want to ask you the question, how do you feel about that verb to settle? I mean, to settle can be used in so many different contexts, both positively and negatively. For example, you could have two people arguing about something, something like, is beef better than lamb? Well, clearly lamb is better than beef. Now you might disagree with me there. You might say, no, chicken's better. But we all agree that lamb is better. So we come, we settle on that, that it's much better. We can grow up and we're encouraged to settle down. In other words, to put our roots down somewhere. And that's seen as a good positive thing. We can feel settled or unsettled about something, which usually indicates whether we're at peace about something. Or we can make our minds up about a decision and we settle on the fact, which means we're resolute, we're not changing our minds, we're going for it. And that too can be a positive or negative thing. But it's this word, settle, that recently just jumped out and got my attention in my, my personal Bible devotion time. And it was just in a story that really nothing significant was there. In fact, it's quite an unremarkable story you found in Genesis. And the character that we're going to look at, I mean, you may not have even heard of him. I certainly hadn't when I read this, these two lines in Genesis. In fact, this character is wedged between two epic characters, one of them being Noah and the other one being Abraham. Now, most of us have heard of those two characters. Noah, of course, built this incredible ark because he heard from God that there was going to be a flood and so he built this ark and everyone thought he was crazy, had lost the plot. He ushered in all these animals and of course the flood came, everyone passed, everyone died except Noah and his family. He did some great things. Then you have Abraham who's almost seen as the father of faith. And, and Abraham believed God in, in his old age that he would be the, he would have many descendants, as numerous as the, sky, as the stars in the sky. 
And so you have these two epic characters and in between that you have this snippet of a story which we're going to read now. And really there doesn't seem to be that much detail, but we're going to read it anyway. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Genesis 11, 31 to 32. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived, to, lived 205 years and he died in Haran. Now, as I just mentioned, there doesn't seem to be anything spectacular about these two short verses. So what can we glean from them? Well, first of all, we find out that Terah is Abram's father. Now, be honest, have you ever heard of him? I hadn't until I started reading this passage of scripture. This is Abram's father. Wow. And in the preceding verses to this passage that we have just read, we read the genealogy of Terah. And Terah is related to Shem. Now, who's Shem? Shem is Noah's son, his firstborn. So Terah is related to Shem and to Noah. He's in the direct line. Now, this is going to feel a little bit like a who do you think you are episode. Have you ever seen that program where people want to discover their family history, their genealogy, and in the process discover who they are as they delve into the background um, of their family history? It's, it's a wonderful program. So we discover that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. And the story goes that Noah after the flood, got drunk one night and in the process of getting drunk, he got naked. That can happen. It never happened to me, but that can happen. And in the process of that night, Shem and Japheth covered their father's shame, whereas Ham exposed it. And so Noah, when Noah finds out this, he proclaims a blessing on Shem and Japheth, their family line, and he places a curse on Ham, the middle son, and says that, he, that Ham will be a servant, a slave to the two other brothers. So we know that Terah is in the family line of blessing from Shem to, to Noah. Now, what else do we know about Terah? We know he has three children, Abram, Nahor and Haran. Now, Haran is the father of Lot and unfortunately Haran dies young. And then Abram marries Sarai and Nahor marries Milcah. Now we pick it up from Genesis 11.31 and we read this story where Terah decides that he's going to uproot his family, their livestock, their servants, everything they are, and they're going to move from where they're living in Ur and head to Canaan. Now there is no, there's nothing saying in scripture why he's decided to do that. There's no voice of God saying to Terah, Terah, you are called to Canaan. There's nothing to indicate why he's made this decision. But it would seem to me that obviously Terah thought that the land of Canaan was more promising for him and his family, that it was worth the journey to uproot everybody and travel there. Have you ever had that feeling that there's more, that there's more ahead of you, that there's more to experience and discover, that there's just more for your future? Well, I believe Terah actually had that feeling. So Terah and his family uproot and they start this massive journey of 2,000 kilometres to head towards Canaan. But when they get to Haran, which is about 1,000 kilometres in, they decide to settle there. Terah decides to settle in Haran, not Canaan. Now, I've got to confess, when I read this story, I had a whole range of mixed feelings. First of all, I felt curious. I'm like, hmm. I wonder why he's decided to do that. I wonder what was going on for him. I mean, the plan was to head to Can Canaan, but he chose to stop in Haran. I started to think through some of the possibilities and then I started to feel quite sympathetic. I mean, if you have you ever been on a journey of a thousand kilometres? That's some undertaking. In a couple of months time, I'm going to be doing a 200 kilometre trek. Um, over nine days, and I tell you what, the preparation work for, to get my body um, physically and then obviously psychologically to actually walk 20 kilometres, and I'm doing it in the mountains, so there's some altitude, you know, is quite an undertaking. These guys walked a thousand kilometres 
and I'm sure most of it would have probably been on foot. Maybe there was some camels to take them on the journey, but that's some distance to, co to cover. That's almost like Melbourne to, I mean, the whole distance would have been like Melbourne to Noosa, if you're thinking about that distance. That's 2,000 kilometres to cover all up. That's huge. Now, I've driven to Noosa before and that was, you know, it took three days. I've never done it by foot. So it's a huge, long journey, which I imagine would have been exhausting. But maybe that's the fact. They felt exhausted. Maybe Tara just said, oh, this journey is too long, too hard, too tiring. I, I can't get there. Have you ever felt so tired on the journey that you're going to? Have you ever felt just, oh, I've had enough? You know, at times I have, ministry sometimes can feel really tiring and exhausting. It feels like it just never ends. And I'm sure some marriages feel like that too. Maybe your current workplace feels a bit like that, that there's no end in sight, that it feels just tiring. And sometimes the best part of the day is just getting into bed. But you know, with only less than halfway to go, Tara decides to stop. And so he almost chooses to stop at a place like if we were travelling from Melbourne to Newcastle. Now, I've been to Newcastle, lovely little town, but it hasn't got anything on Noosa. Noosa's fabulous. And Tara doesn't decide, OK, let's stop in Haran, let's recoup our energy, let's check out the local sites, let's eat some good food, and when we're ready, let's get back out there and head to Canaan. No, he completely changes the plan. He says, no, no, we're stopping and we're staying here. You know, there's nothing wrong with changing your mind, right? We all, we all do that. But I can't help but think there is something wrong, and especially in this context. And I actually feel sad. That was one of the other emotions that I started to feel. You know, this is not about dwelling in a different location 725 kilometres away. This is about the journey that Terra and his family were called to. Terra was called to a land of promise, not a land of comfort. And something about what he experienced in Haran made him feel comfortable to stop there and not go the whole way. So I want to ask you a question. Where do you settle for a land of comfort rather than a land of promise? I'm going to ask you that again. Where have you settled for a land of comfort rather than a land of promise? You know, let's not kid ourselves. We all have our creature comforts that we enjoy. I certainly do. I love my coffee first thing in the morning. It gets me going. I love my dressing gown at the end of the day. I love falling into my bed. Those are my creature comforts amongst some other things. And, you know, just over a couple of months ago, I went on a trip to Uluru and part of the tour was to sleep under the stars in swag bags. And I was quite excited about that. And then people started to talk to me, have you ever slept in a swag bag? I'm like, no. Oh, it's claustrophobic. It's really hard on the ground. If it rains, you're going to get drenched. So I was quite apprehensive about this experience. And on the first night, I did not get a wink of sleep. Everyone around me was snoring. The ground was hard. My back was hurting. Um, I was just like, oh my gosh, I've got three nights of this. I don't know if I can do this. On the second night, I wisened up, I got earplugs in and um, I think because I was so tired, I crashed. And as I was lying there, as I was about to fall asleep, I look up and the incredible night sky, the reason why I was doing it in the first place was before me. And oh my goodness, it was spectacular. There is something about the stars in the outback that everyone needs to see. By the third night, I kind of was gotten, gotten used to it. And, you know, I remember waking up around 2 a.m. and I just happened to look up and, again, this beautiful night sky and I can see the saucepan and I can see the Southern Cross and then these shooting stars took place. And I was just so excited and I was just like, this is amazing. This was worth the pain and the discomfort of sleeping on the ground and in the cold. And, you know, that's sometimes what happens. We get out of our comfort zones, but there are benefits to being out of our comfort zone. So what's the problem of settling for a land of comfort? The problem is that we will never get to uh, know what we're destined for and what we're capable of. You'll never get to experience the benefits that may be laying ahead for you and for the people around you. 
And you know, some people can live with that. But as Christians, I don't believe we're called for that. Terah never got to see and experience what he was destined for because he chose to settle for less. And now we don't know why. We can only ponder uh, the reasons why. As I said, maybe he got tired. Maybe he thought near enough is good enough. Maybe the food was just really good in Haran. We don't know. What we do know is that he set out for Canaan and he chose to settle in Haran. And the land of comfort is certainly a place of less, less hassle, less effort, less pain. But let's not kid ourselves. It is a place of less. Now, we can get comfortable with all sorts of things. We can get comfortable with where our relationship is with God, where our faith level is at, how our relationships, our personal relationships are going, maybe our career path. We can just get comfortable with what we have and never really seek more. We can even get comfortable with our examination of the scriptures. You know, recently Pastor Rob did a new series of cross-examined and he challenged some of our thinking around those atonement theories, particularly the propitiation theory of atonement. And I know that some people were really challenged by that. And I, you know, I love the fact that we can look at something and question it and look at it in new light and see a new fresh perspective Never looking for more, I think, is a problem. Settling for just what we have, because there is more to discover always in God. There is always more faith, more healing, more restoration, more wholeness, more provision there available for us in God. And when we just get comfortable, we don't allow ourselves to be challenged. We don't allow ourselves to question And ultimately what happens is we stunt our growth and our faith. And the land of promise, promise, if anything, is all about faith and exercising of faith. And we're called to be people of faith. You know, when I look at Jesus, Jesus didn't come to planet Earth just to live a comfortable life. John 10.10 says he has come to give us life and life to the full. A full abundant life is what Jesus left heaven for to enable us to access that. But, you know, John 10.10 also comes with a warning that there is an enemy who wants to rob, steal, kill and destroy what God has for us. The enemy wants us to settle for less. But when I look at Jesus and the way he lived his life here on planet Earth, it was totally living in his discomfort zone in my point of view. He chose to leave heaven to come to earth He chose to be born as a vulnerable child in in squalid conditions. He chose for his creation to actually care for him. In his ministry, Jesus challenged and confronted the religious. He gave new perspective on, on scripture, which not everyone was up for. He healed on the days when the religious told him not to. He fraternized with sinners. He upset the apple cart in the temple. He agonised over his upcoming death in the garden and yet walked silently to his death. None of that says comfort to me. That's completely living in a discomfort zone. In the book of Joshua, Joshua gives us some glimpse of what happened to Terah. In Joshua 24, 2, it says, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. You know, when we settle into comfort, there is this danger of worshipping other gods and other idols. Choosing to settle in a land of comfort is absolutely no way for a Christian to live. The journey to the land of promise actually keeps us tethered to God. It's where we need God more than anything else. And as we're challenged, we actually look at what we're relying upon and who we're relying upon. It forces us to confront our fears. It forces us to take a look at ourselves and push beyond ourselves and rely on God's strength and God's joy and God's peace to take us through. And I found in life, that that's usually what brings life. So what's so good about the land of promise? The land of promise is a journey made up of many faith steps 
and faith needs to be developed like a muscle. Now, under here, there may be some muscles, but I can speak to these muscles and say, muscles grow. Muscles grow. You know, I could speak to these muscles till I'm blue in the face to grow. The problem is they're not going to grow until I actually exercise them, until I actually probably go to the gym or do some other physical activity that's going to help these muscles to grow. Faith is the same. Faith needs to be exercised in order to grow. If we want things to shift, we need to exercise and be out of our comfort zone where faith resides. And it really only gets exercised when we're in that place, when we're heading to a land of promise. What promise are you exercising at the moment? You know, there are over 3,500 3, promises in the Bible that God has made at various times. Promises actually take work. They take faith. They don't just get handed to you on a plate. Now, the topic of promises may be triggering for some of you today as I'm talking about them. Perhaps you've held on to a promise that hasn't come to pass yet. Or maybe you think the time has passed and it hasn't come about the way you expected. Perhaps you are maybe feeling some grief and disappointment around the whole um, concept of promises. You know, I have some personal understanding around that myself. It can feel like sometimes that you don't know what to hope for or dream for or even ask for because you're living in that place of disappointment and grief. But one thing I have found out is that when we place our hope in God, being our sustaining hope, when we place our hope in the promise maker and trust his purpose and plan in our life, which may look different to how we expect, that we're still on that road of faith, that we're still believing for more in our life, that we can trust his plan, then God is faithful as we take those steps. You know, last year, um, I was personally shown some areas in my life, um, in my personal history that was affecting me. And I'm going to be honest, it would have been just so much easier if I got really busy with life, if I just really got busy and ignored what was sort of coming up for me. But, you know, I desired freedom. My promised land at, at this time was more freedom. I needed more freedom so, this, that, so I didn't feel so held back. You know, I could have easily chosen to stay in my comfort zone and ignored. But the land of the promise was calling me to freedom. So I, I decided to do the work and I, I got a spiritual director who's been journeying with me uh, in some of these areas. And I've been, as I've been going through this process, I've been getting healing and revelation and freedom, greater freedom. And I feel that today. And it's been rewarding, even though it has been at times quite painful. James 1.2 says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Our faith muscles grow through endurance. And as we keep growing this muscle, we are becoming mature and complete and whole in the process. That land of promise is all about becoming complete. It's a journey of wholeness. It's a journey of freedom, of healing, restoration and provision. It's a journey of walking in our true identity of sons and daughters and claiming our inheritance as sons and daughters. And that inheritance is not just for, for yourselves to enjoy, it's also for others to experience through you and for you to invite others to. Terah never got to experience the blessing that lay in store for him and his family. That blessing got passed down to his son because ultimately God calls his son Abram to leave his father's household and head to that land of promise. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 7, it reads like this. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went. 
as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram could have just settled into the life of Haran. He could have continued what he had and been content with that, but he could not ignore he was called for more. There was more in store in the land of promise, and I want to encourage you that there is more for us to set out and head for. There is more in God to experience, more abundant living, more freedom, healing, peace, restoration, provision. And this setting out for more, I've got to tell you, it won't be easy. There will be hassle, but as our great senior minister, Pastor Christy Buckingham says all the way, all the time to me, hassle is better than regret. We know Abram set out and for doing so, he received a new identity. His name got changed to Abraham. He received an inheritance and a fulfilment of a promise. He became the father of a great nation of faith walkers. And because of that, he's listed as one of the heroes of faith. Hebrews 11.8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went out to a place he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God. Abraham would never have been listed in Hebrews 11 if he stayed in Haran, in the land of comfort. And I want to encourage us that we too are called to greater things. We too are called to the land of promise. It starts with receiving Jesus as our saviour and it continues on as we work out our salvation and through faith. There's always more for us to step into faith for and I want to encourage you with that today. I would like to close our time together with some prayer and I particularly want to pray for three groups of people here today. I want to pray for people who have this sense that there is more and it starts with having a relationship with Jesus. Perhaps you don't know what that's all about but it's just taking that first step of asking Jesus into our life. I also want to pray for people who feel stuck in a land of comfort and maybe you're feeling stirred here today. Maybe there's something that I've said that's going, yeah, there is more and I am just comfortable in my, in my zone um, and I want to start living in a discomfort zone. And so it's just taking that first step of acknowledging that because as we do, our attitude also changes in the process. I also want to pray for people who are living in that place of heading to the land of promise, and maybe you're feeling a little tired and weary. Um, we could all be there. Some, that journey can sometimes be challenging and hard. Well, I want to stand with you today and pray for God's strength and peace. So if you fall into any one of these categories, let this prayer fall, be your prayer here today. Father God, I just thank you for everyone who's joined us online today, and I particularly want to pray for those who have never set a journey yet with Jesus, but they want to do so today. They want to invite Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Lord, I pray right now that Jesus, you will come in. We ask that you would be their Lord and Saviour. We acknowledge that we have sinned against you and that we need you, Lord. Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit to fill these people right now, that they may personally know you and that they can go on this journey with you and that they will come to know you and love you more and more. I also want to pray for anyone right now who's feeling really stuck, stuck in where you are, but you have this inkling there is more. Father, I just thank you right now that you're stirring it in them. Lord, I pray that you will give them uh, a boost <laughs> in the Holy Ghost. I pray that you will place before them a desire to step out, to try new things, to discern where you are calling them to next. And Lord, we know that as we take those steps, you direct our paths. And so Lord, I pray for new steps ahead today. And Lord, I also pray for anyone here right now who's feeling tired on that land to promise, where you may be feeling very challenged and weary. 
Lord, I ask the Holy Spirit to come afresh, that you would strengthen them by your power and by your might. And I pray for fresh joy to well up within them. Lord, we stand with all those who are feeling tired and weary, and we thank you that it's in your strength that we can head to the land of promise. Amen. Well, I hope this word has uh, challenged you, encouraged you in many ways, and I hope you have a great rest of weekend. Now it's back to Pastor Rob and Gabby. Thank you. Well, what a wonderful sermon, uh, as always, from Sandra. She always gives us something to think about. And I, I just love that, um, the story of Abraham's family you know, mm. and, and that we could reflect on that. Are there times that we've been called to do something and we've stopped halfway? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And Sandra's messages are always like super practical as yeah. well, which is Awesome. That's why we love Sandra. Well, we love Sandra for more, more reasons than that. We but <laughs> anyway, but speaking of that, one of Sandra's roles at Bayside Church is actually the general manager of um, community care. I know that yes. you're aware of this, but yeah. for those who don't don't know at home, and we've got a very exciting event that's coming up um, for to raise money for Bayside Community Care, and yeah. that is our trivia night, which yes. we haven't had for a few years now. Because lockdowns. Yeah, yeah, lockdowns and the C word that we don't talk about anymore. <laughs> but um, anyway, regardless of that, this year's theme is actually 80s, which I'm going to do horribly at because I was not born until 93. Okay. So now um, I'm feeling old again. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the theme of this. Uh, it really is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I'm sure that Pastor Rob will do great. I'm sure a lot of people at home will do great. And I, that's not saying that you're old. I'm going to <laughs> yeah. Stop on that train of thought now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> but uh, but in all seriousness, like we would love to have you guys come along. So um, the date for that is on the screen right now. And as well as that, if you would like to actually sponsor the event, um, that would be awesome as well. So if you are interested in doing that, you can also contact the email address that's on your screen right now. Wonderful. Looking yes. forward to that. That's mm. our major fundraiser for Bayside Community Care mm. every year as well and yeah. supplements, you know, what's raised in First Fruits and other other things through the year. Yes. So wonderful. Tuesday Night Live is coming up this Tuesday night, mm. 8 o'clock. You can join me on Facebook or YouTube, Bayside Church's YouTube page, mm. and we'll be having another hour of lots of great teaching and chat. Do we know what we're talking about or is it a I surprise? I thought you might ask me that. No, I'm going to say it's a surprise because at the moment I don't know. Oh, well. <laughs> Send so, in more curly questions to him, please. I'll be, <laughs> yeah. I'll be surprised as well, yeah. but we know it's going to be good. Always is, always yeah. is. But I think that's basically everything. This has been great. It been, has been. Yeah. It has been. It's been a good time and been yeah. a good time hanging out with you guys as well. And um, we hope that we will get to see you again really soon. See you. See ya.